happy little games. Going to a movie theater in the early 1980s on Saturday afternoons is a memory I'll always cherish. With my large bag of extra buttery popcorn and a big box of Junior Mints, I would be all set for the next couple of hours. After watching those glorious hot dogs dance across the screen, the lights dimmed and the magic soon began. Some of the movies I went to see during this time frame were Raiders of the Lost Ark, Return of the Jedi, and Superman 2. There was one movie in particular that brought a tear to this 11-year-old's eyes and warmed the hearts of moviegoers everywhere. Despite being short and brown and speaking just a little bit funny, he would always give me the warm fuzzies whenever I would think about him. No, I'm not talking about Mr. Hanky the Christmas Poo. I'm talking about E.T. the Extraterrestrial, the Atari 2600 video game adaptation. What was the original idea that Steven Spielberg wanted for this game? Did this game really cause the ruination of Atari? Were there thousands of these unsold games buried in a New Mexico desert? So grab your Reese's Pieces and watch out for the agents. This is the history of E.T. the Extraterrestrial. The year is 1982 and E.T. the Extraterrestrial is number one at the box office and also in our hearts. The movie was the brainchild of Steven Spielberg who had based the character on an imaginary friend he had created after his parents divorced in 1960. By this time, Mr. Spielberg had already directed a number of classic hit movies including Jaws, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and his first foray into beings from another dimension, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The movie was a bona fide smash hit earning adjusted for inflation just over $1.3 billion. Of course, with a property this successful, a video game could not be far behind. I mean, if they can make a video game based on Porky's or Bachelor Party, then E.T. should be a slam dunk. After a lengthy negotiation process between Spielberg, Universal Studios, and Atari, the license was secured for between 25 and 30 million dollars, which adjusted for inflation is between 55 and 60 million dollars. That's a whole lot of cartridges that have to be sold. CEO of Atari Ray Kassar thought this was a terrible idea and that the license would not make a very good game. This is the same Ray Kassar who let the Fantastic Four, the name given to the four superstar programmers, David Crane, Larry Kaplan, Alan Miller, and Bob Whitehead, who would go on to form the company of Activision. All they wanted at the time was a small pay increase and their names in the credits of their games. Mr. Kassar's response? You are no more important than the guy putting the game in the box on the production line. The license was secured in July of 1982 and Mr. Spielberg had one name in mind when it came to designing the game for Atari. Howard Scott Warshaw Mr. Warshaw had a couple million selling games under his belt including Yars Revenge, Raiders of the Lost Ark. After Raiders was completed, he flew out to the offices of Steven Spielberg and played through the game for him, which Mr. Spielberg absolutely loved. Ray Kassar had informed Howard that Mr. Spielberg specifically requested him to do the video game adaptation of E.T. The problem was, it had to be completed by September 1st so it would be in stores in time for Christmas, which meant five weeks from start to finish. 
At that time, development on a single game would take between 6 and 12 months to complete. Kassar offered Howard $200,000 and an all-expense-paid trip to Hawaii. Howard agreed and wanted to do an adventure game similar to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Kassar told him that a Learjet would be picking him up in 36 hours to take him to the offices of Steven Spielberg so that he could go over his game design. After showing his design from start to finish, Mr. Spielberg sat there rubbing his chin and the first question out of his mouth was, can't you do something more like Pac-Man? Howard thought in his head, no. Not in five weeks. I can do my type of game design in five weeks, but not Pac-Man. But he didn't say that. He said that such a beloved movie deserved a grand game design and his adventure style is exactly what was needed. Mr. Spielberg agreed and soon work began. He had a development unit installed in his home due to the sheer amount of programming hours it was going to take to complete the project while sleeping as little as four hours a night. especially for systems from Atari. The video game that lets you help E.T. get home. Just in time for Christmas. Happy Holidays from Atari. E.T. the Extraterrestrial was released just in time for the Christmas shopping season in 1982. You take on the role of E.T. who has to collect three pieces of an interplanetary phone. It won't be easy as the pieces are scattered randomly throughout the various pits in the game. There is no time limit in the game, although E.T. has an energy bar which decreases the more active the character is, such as moving, teleporting, falling into a pit, which will happen over and over and over and over and over and also levitating back out. To restore your energy, you can collect Reese's Pieces. If you manage to collect nine bits of candy, you can call Elliot who will give you a piece of the phone. Once you collect all three pieces of the phone, you have to take E.T. into an open area so he can essentially phone home. No idea if it's a collect call or not. Once the phone call has been made, a clock appears in the upper right of the screen. You have to take him to the designated landing zone before the clock reaches zero. At this point, you have to wait for your spaceship to arrive and take E.T. back home. At this point, the game starts over with the same difficulty, but the pieces are placed in different locations. You start the game with three lives, and if you expire during that time, Elliot will come out to revive you. If you manage to find a geranium in one of the pits, you will be granted an extra life. The game is divided into six environments, each one taken straight from the movie. All of the items are located within the pits, and once they have been collected, you have to levitate E.T. out by holding up on the joystick. E.T. will stretch his neck up and blast off like it's Taco Tuesday. There are a couple of antagonists in the game, including scientists who want to take E.T. back for an alien autopsy, and also FBI agents who chase you and if caught will confiscate a piece of your telephone.
When the game was released, it sold over 2 million copies and was another million seller for Howard Scott Warshaw. At the time, there was no internet, so word of mouth spread via playgrounds and especially video game magazines. Atari experienced the one thing they had not encountered, which was customer dissatisfaction. People were returning this game in droves, citing specifically the poor gameplay and graphics. In the last 20 or so years, it's often been credited as being the worst video game ever created and bringing about the downfall of Atari. Now, it is by no means the worst video game I have ever played, but it's also not the best either. If more time would have been given to playtesting and fixing some of the bugs in the collision detection with the pits, then the game could have turned out a whole lot better. Rumor has it that more cartridges were made of this game and especially Pac-Man than there were Atari 2600 systems in existence. Rumors have also been circulating since the 1990s that Atari had taken thousands of unsold cartridges and buried them somewhere in the desert. Around 2005, I joined a great little forum called the Atari Age where rumblings persisted about the buried treasure. Every few months or so, a new lead would pop up whether it would be a newspaper article or people who claim to have inside knowledge. Retro video game detectives finally tracked down the general area which was located in the city of Alamo Gordo, New Mexico. Apparently, 20 or so semi-trucks were filled with these cartridges. They were dumped at the local landfill, crushed, and covered in concrete. In 2013, Alamo Gordo City Commission approved a documentary to be filmed as they excavated the site and searched for the missing cartridges. They struck pay dirt, finding various Atari cartridges including E.T., Pac-Man, and even peripherals such as joysticks and touchpads. The name of the documentary is Atari Game Over so check it out if you're curious about any of this. So was E.T. really to blame for the downfall? Partially, but there were other factors in motion as well. The technology had been around since 1977, and while the company grossed close to $2 billion in 1982, when the video game crash happened in 1983, the bottom fell out and it was all over. At the time, people thought video games were a fad, and it wasn't until Nintendo entered the U.S. market a couple of years later and jump-started the industry we all know and love today. Nolan Bushnell, who had founded Atari, had ended up selling his share in the company for $22 million just before the VCS was released. He stated that if he were still in the company, he would have introduced the Atari 5200 in 1980 and then released the Atari 7800 in 1983 just to keep things fresh in people's minds. E.T. is definitely a unique game. It uses the adventure motif that Howard Scott Warshaw brought to life so successfully in Raiders of the Lost Ark but unfortunately, due to development times, the gameplay mechanics could not be refined. If you've never had a chance to eat some Reese's Pieces and see what all the hubbub is about, give it a shot. Or not. Maybe you'll like this game and maybe you won't. But you owe it to yourself to fire up that old 2600 and give E.T. a go. You might be glad you did. I'd like to thank Howard Scott Warshaw for answering some of the questions on the creation of this game. Thanks, Howard. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment down below. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Thank you so much for watching.